sitting in. You're going to call me Tom, though. I mean, the introduction is okay. Okay. But you're not going to call me that. No, you? I'll call you Tom once we start. Yeah. I'll t once we begin. Yeah. But in the introduction. Okay. 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 Three, two, one. I'm sitting in Manlius, New York, outside of Syracuse, uh, New York. Now let's start again. Three, <laughs> three, two, one. I am sitting in Manlius, New York, outside of Syracuse with uh, Dr. Thomas Sass, author of uh, a couple of dozen books about psychiatry, mental illness, the drug laws, and related issues, personal responsibility. Uh, and I'd like to ask you a few questions, if so, this is okay with you, Tom. Well, first I want to thank you for coming up and visiting me. It was a pleasure to have you. Well, great pleasure thank, thank to be you. here. I hope I can come back soon. I hope so, too. <laughs> uh, let me start, uh, when did you first begin thinking about these issues? When I was quite young, uh, in my early teens, maybe even a little before, uh, uh, especially the issue of incarceration. Uh, as a child, very early, somehow I became aware of the idea that uh, of liberty. I mean, I felt as a child the absence of liberty uh, not that I had a, a, a bad childhood, not at all, uh, just to the contrary, but uh, the school, of course, the school situation was authoritarian, in that sense oppressive, demanding, uh, uh, in a very positive sense, uh, as I look back, and even then I felt that I was getting a very good education and appreciated that. Uh, but as a child, uh, I was a very obedient child, I felt uh, regulated, and uh, I very early became aware both of that and of something else which was very striking when I grew up in Hungary uh, in the 20s, uh, 30s. Uh, there were a lot of beggars, and someone one was uh, well aware, my family, and I lived in the middle of the city in a very nice plush area. Uh, so I was well aware of uh, the poverty that also uh, so the economics of, of life struck me very early. The, uh, in, in your autobiographical essay, which is published in the book uh, Sauce on the Fire, you say something about being aware of people being confined in uh, madhouses or, or asylums, or, and that you didn't understand why people who hadn't committed crimes were being held. As a, how, how early were you aware of that, that that was happening? In my early teens, some of that was, of course, in the newspapers, in the literature, I became aware of that, uh, that people were confined, if they were criminals, if they broke the law and uh, were convicted under the criminal law, and also I was aware that uh, mad people were, uh, psychiatry, psychoanalysis were somehow in the press very much like they are here. Uh, so I became aware of that uh, quite early. And, uh, was puzzled and disturbed by it. I was disturbed by the whole idea of being imprisoned. I mean, that, that, that seemed... But it was around this time that you heard that the reason, the stated reason for people being confined was some mental condition or brain condition? Of course, mental, condition. mental illness. This was very much in the, in the air as it is here, but in a bit different format. It was... Uh, uh, I don't know how early I became aware of that. There was always, a, at that time, there was a skeptical, critical uh, atmosphere about psychiatry and psychoanalysis. Well, it, well, both of them were very much in the air, especially mm -hmm. in psychoanalysis. So something was not in the vein which it is here at, at present. It was, uh, it was, at that time, it was in, in, in a skeptical mood. Uh, the press, uh, uh, columnists, uh, there was a great deal of, of uh, criticism expressed of this, that there's something wrong here. Uh, the jokes about uh, uh, you don't know who is crazy in a mental hospital except by looking at who has the keys. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I, I was, so this, uh, this kind this of influenced you then? Yeah. What, uh, And I was, I should add, I was interested in medicine from a very early age on. Uh, 
And uh, I was interested, I was intrigued by what well, that is got to do with disease. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, the idea that brain disease causes this sort of thing. Uh, syphilis was very much, was a very common disease. Mm -hmm. And uh, I became aware of that, that this is a bad disease, how it's caught, and uh, it causes insanity. So did you, uh, did you decide to become a physician or fairly early? Very As early. a teenager? Very, very correct. And then at what point did you decide to go on that, to specialize in psychiatry? Well, that was a much later uh, development. Uh, I, I felt I knew a great deal about psychiatry and psychoanalysis even before I went to medical school. In medical school, and I, really, I wanted to become a doctor. I was interested in how the body works. Sort of, I always thought of it as in terms of I wanted to know what's under the hood. I mean, here you are driving this car, which is your body. And people have no idea what's inside. Well, uh, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to be a doctor, not so much to practice it, although I was planning to do that, but to understand. Uh, I wanted to understand two things. It seems to me that was necessary: how the body works and how society works. Mm -hmm. The laws, the customs. I mean, this. Uh, I was consciously aware of this. It's a good idea to know these two. Two things, and then. Uh, of course, I didn't go to medical school until we, my family and I got to this country. And then there were other dimensions, other problems, uh, in terms of I had to make money. Mm. And so, uh, once I became a doctor, I was, an obvious, I was interested in becoming a, a physician. Uh, and I started to, uh, I had a residency in medicine. I was on my way to becoming a regular internist, doctor. Uh, but at that point, I bit the bullet, so to speak. I did not like the idea of practicing medicine because uh, I, th I was a very good medical student. I was first in my class, which was very competitive at that time. And I knew, I felt I knew medicine. I said, this is a boring thing. I mean, so what do you do? People come with hypertension, diabetes, this and that. I mean, this is current drive. I mean, this is like working in a restaurant and making hamburgers, I mean. <laughs> which it is, uh, basically. To the practice of medicine is uh, assembly line. Uh, what assembly line? Uh, yeah, well, it's not you. Know, uh, <laughs> so you thought there'd be more adventure and uh, and I well, it was not, not so much more adventure, but I was interested in politics and religion, in in psychiatry, in psychoanalysis, and I thought that this would be a more interesting way of uh, earning a living, which was sort of given I, that I had to do and I wanted to do. I didn't like the idea. I mean, when we came to my family was quite well to do in Budapest. We were poor here. And uh, so uh, being poor was not a pleasant state, not, not having money, basically. Just to set the timeline, you, you came to the United States in the late 30s. In 1938. From I, was, I was 18 and a half, mm -hmm. exactly, in, in the October. Okay, so, so psychiatry then was sort of an intersection of your interests in... It's, it, it wasn't really psychiatry. I wanted to uh, practice psychoanalysis, okay. which to me was conversation, which mm -hmm. is what it is. Which is kind of applied philosophy, ethics. I mean, how do, you, how do we live? Why do we live? Yeah. Now, how do we conduct ourselves? When people hear the, the word psychoanalysis, they'll, they'll think of Freud. So what's your relationship to... Well, that was psychoanalysis by definition, that, you know, this is something that Freud uh, created, although obviously he didn't create this. This goes back to biblical times, I mean, this and he himself compared it to the confessional. This is people talking about their lives, uh, mm -hmm. Socratic dialogues. But the point is that in order to become a psychoanalyst at that time, and in any case, I had those credentials, you had to be an MD. Mm -hmm. Now, this has since changed. But in American psychoanalysis, this was a requirement. This is a story, separate story. Uh, so I had to have psychiatric training to become a psychoanalyst. And anyway, from a credentialing point of view, this was a good idea. I felt, you know, one has to have all the credentials in order to make money properly. So uh, I trained in psychiatry and at the same time trained in psychoanalysis. And by, by the, just before, before, before I was 30 years old, I was all finished with my training, which was very young uh, for both of these specialties. And then I practiced psychoanalysis, actually, in Chicago for 
uh, five years. So at that stage, were you, you concerned about the medicalizing of uh, personal problems? That's putting it mildly. That is putting it mildly. I, from, the, from before the word go, I realized, and again, one shouldn't give me too much credit for this, because you have to remember that the idea of so-called lay analysis, there were many people in Vienna and Budapest already, in the 1920s, from, from the, after the First World War, where Freud's daughter, Anna Freud, being a kind of a, uh, a good example, uh, her highest education was finishing a gymnasium, finishing high school, and she was a prominent psychoanalyst, Eric Erikson, uh, Bruno Bettelheim, there were many other people who were not doctors who practiced psychoanalysis. And Freud himself wrote a book called The Question of Lay Analysis. Freud was wonderfully inconsistent about this because on the one hand he compared it to surgery, it's a precise uh, treatment, just like surgery, a medical treatment, he kept saying that. At the same time he said it's not a treatment at all, nothing to do with medicine. So I took that seriously and it was obvious it's not a treatment. I mean, a psychoanalyst doesn't undress a person, doesn't examine him, has no tests. So all this is obvious. You don't need any education for this. That there's no mental illness. Mm -hmm. It was to be a given. That's a premise. There's nothing to study here. So part of your objective in getting into all this was to debunk this whole worldview? My world view? objective was certainly to critique it. I was well aware of this whole thing being a massive social, quasi-religious phenomenon, that this is not going to be so easily destroyed. That's why I was rather careful in my professional life of what I said and when I said it. I kept my mouth shut, so to speak, for many years, although from the very earliest time, in the 50s, I wrote papers, mm. but they were relatively in obscure journals, questioning the idea of in effect saying that there is no mental illness and this is a... Before we get to the, your having to keep somewhat subtle for a while, I'll, I'll, I just want to not let anything get by. Uh, I, we use the term medicalizing personal problems or problems in living, you call it. Not everybody may be familiar with that concept. What, what does that mean, medicalizing non-medical problems? Well, that goes back to the earlier history of psychiatry. That really predates Freud. This is where Freud came in. After all, Freud was a neurologist, and when he started to practice, he was confronted with a lot of people, many of them young women, who had two typical symptoms, which don't exist anymore. It was called hysteria then. They couldn't get out of bed, they couldn't walk. If they started to walk, they fell over, uh, lost their balance, or they complained of pain. Now, these were called hysterical pain and hysterical paralysis at that time. Now, there were many neurological diseases, uh, multiple sclerosis, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which were known, uh, syphilis in all its manifestations, which affected the nervous system, central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. So the question always was that these people were sick. They couldn't walk, that's why they couldn't walk. There's a wonderful old story called the story of San Michele by a Swedish writer whose name I now can't think of, which I cite in the Myth of Melanus, which I read in my teens, which was a popular novel, which describes this psychiatrist working with Charcot in the late 1800s and how he observed when a mental hospital, this is an actual story from the story of San Michele, that's the title of the, title of the book, that a large mental hospital uh, this is the late 19th century. These were large wooden structures. Uh, people misbehaved. They often go, there, was often, there were often fires in them. And there would be 50 people, women, in various conditions, all of whom were paralyzed. They were all in bed. Couldn't walk, couldn't move. The hospital caught fire. The fire was put out. People came to see what, what happened. And they found that 25 of the 50 women were in bed, burned to death. And 25 of the women were out on the lawn frolicking. Conclusion, they were malingering. The concept of malingering was a very basic concept in those days. 
Now we still use it in the Arabic military service, but that's what we are talking about. Playing the sick role as against being sick. <laughs> These are two simple sociological concepts which have been around for a long time, which are now all confused. We never use these terms anymore in the New York Times. Anybody who now complains of something is immediately called a patient and is sick. But people who don't feel well, who act, act sick, and not, don't necessarily have a disease. Well, that's where I came in, and that to me is all obvious. There's nothing to discuss here. Mm -hmm. Disease is an objective phenomenon. I like to actually use uh, the economic analogy. It's like the gold standard. Money is only gold. Now, whether something is gold, you can determine chemically, whether it's copper or bronze, or just looks yellow or gold. Now, it's the same thing. A lot of things look yellow and are not gold. A lot of people act sick, have headaches, have diarrhea, are anxious, are unhappy. They're not sick unless you can find a disease mm. in the body. Now, it's a pathological concept of disease. Again, I, I had nothing to do with this. I didn't invent this. Mm. That's why, that's why when people die, they often they typically have an autopsy and examine the body. Or what are they looking for? They are not looking for mental disease. You can't find that in a corpse. So th this takes us then to your view of um, mental disease. Mental is related to the word mind. Uh, your point is a mind can't be sick. Right. And so what is, what is mind? If it, if it can't be sick, what is it? I mean, you've written a whole book. On but there is no such thing as mind. It's a, it's a word. You once told me it's a verb, not a noun. In English, it was actually I discovered when I looked into this a long time ago, that until the 17th century, mind was only a verb. And it turns out that actually but in French and in German and in Hungarian also, there is no word corresponding to mind. In German, there are only two words, Geist, which is spirit, and Seele, which is soul. Mm. Now, the mind is historically the psychological replacement for the soul. When people stop believing in a soul, which is somewhere in you, and then it goes to heaven when you die, or to hell. Well, most modern people don't believe in that. But they believe that there is a mind. Well, there is no mind. There are only persons. And so what we mean by mind, when we say mind, what we're really referring to is, is what, a series of activities. Is that right? I mean... Correct. We are referring to a series of activities that we are referring to another thing, which is a much better concept, and that is a self. We have an enduring concept that, that I am, I have a self, which is not your self. Hmm. But it's not a thing that... It's not a, it's a concept. An autopsy you don't it's find. A, it's purely a concept. Mm -hmm. No, it's a concept. It's like the concept of home as distinguished from house. Mm -hmm. So, given it's that it's... A home is not a thing. It's, it's, a, it's a fear, it's a concept. The house is a thing. Mm -hmm. but so it's not a... about, People talk about selling their home. You can't sell your home, you can only sell your house. Mm -hmm. Then you have to create a home in your new house. This really has to do with a careful use. I was also very interested, one of my ambitions besides being a doctor, was becoming a writer. So I, I liked language, foreign languages I was good in. Uh, Many people in Hungary had to speak several languages. And they spoke German, French. There was, ex you know, any, everybody in my educational social circle spoke at least two languages, two other languages. Latin, of course, we all had to learn. Mm -hmm. so, so I was aware that language is a tool. It's not something natural that it, that it doesn't. Words don't correspond to things in nature in some kind of a scientific way. Mm -hmm. that, that words are tools. Huh? So if we think of mind as some sort of organ, then then we are finished. Then you're led to think that well, it could become right. a disease, and that's what we think of. And then we now nowadays it's popular, of course, in neuroscience to think the mind is a brain. Or science, or mm -hmm. many people yeah, say that the mind is secreted, like the kidney secretes urine, the brain secretes mind. That's a very popular view now, even in the popular pop. Press. Well, what's, wrong, what's wrong with also that? What's wrong with that? so called neuroscience. It's nothing wrong with it except it's nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> Why can't the mind be reduced to the brain? <laughs> well, take a look at the analogy with the urine and the kidney. Now, this becomes a lot more complicated and sophisticated. 
science is inherently materialistic. We are talking about material objects. I'm not talking about now string theory, about uh, you know, highfalutin uh, you know, nuclear uh, theoretical physics. Mm. On a practical level, we talk about electrical wires, lights, light bulbs, mm -hmm. cameras, shoes, socks, I mean, things. Yes. Diseases are things associated with material things. Diabetes is associated with the pancreas. Pneumonia is associated with the lungs. Heart disease is in the heart. It's not in, the, not in your toes or in your hair. You, well, there are diseases in the skin, but they, they are not just, you in other words, yeah, that's why we talk about these various diseases, skin diseases, eye diseases, mm -hmm. ear diseases, bone diseases. We talk about mental diseases. But there's no mind, so. Now, early on, mental disease was still associated with, with the brain and then then ceased to be so associated and now it's coming back again. Is that right? Well, it, was, it depends how far back you go. If you go back into deep biblical, into pre-scientific times, pre-modern times, then mental disease, was well, not, there was no such term. It was associated with human tragedy. Well, what is it? Let's go back 400 years, a little more than 400 years. There was no mental illness. There was no psychiatry. There were no mental hospitals. People do it well. But there was Shakespeare. And every one of his great tragedies has been reinterpreted in psychiatric terms. But this is idiotic because there was no such thing as psychiatry then. It's like interpreting some of the communications in terms of transistors or radios, that's just stupid. Othello was not mentally sick. Hamlet was not mentally sick. Lear was not mentally sick. Well, everybody now says Lear was depressed. Well, he certainly was depressed. But it was not an illness. It was the way he lived his life. It was a tragedy. And that's part of the greatness of Shakespeare, right? That he showed you that why... Is, that is... And that's... I mean, people forget. Freud was never a psychiatrist. Freud studied two types of human beings where he got his ideas. Himself, which is the only way to study psychology, because the only person you have access to is yourself. You don't really know anybody else, hmm. unless you live with them for a very long time. You only know, really, your parents, your spouse, your children, and very, very good friends. You can't know anybody by meeting them for a couple of hours. So a psychiatrist can't possibly know a person. But the idea now is that somebody talks, a psychiatrist talks to somebody for half an hour, and then he knows more about that person than the person knows himself. Well, if you believe that, you are just stupid. What can you say about it? That's why there are all these stories about psychiatrists releasing the wrong people. They go out, they say they are perfectly okay, and then they go out and kill somebody. Well, why not? They don't know them. So who did Freud study? Shakespeare's plays and Greek tragedies. Now those are also descriptions of complicated human tragic behavior. Women killing their children, Medea. Well, now a woman kills their children, she goes to a male hospital, I tell you. She can't be guilty of a crime. So wh why yeah. have playwrights and novelists been much more uh, uh, on target? With what motivates human beings? Because this is very nice. Because, because, because to write an interesting story of human life, they have to have motives, reasons for their actions, which can be communicated to the reader. Otherwise, it's not interesting. Obviously, Hamlet was a, per he was a young man who realized that his mother killed his father, slept with his uncle, and conspired with his uncle and then the uncle became the king. Now put yourself in that situation, you are 15 or 16, or however old Hamlet was, and you get to know all this about your mother. Well, this is certainly going to perturb you. You are not going to be now, how can you, you can't be a normal human being now, living with a mother like this. Mm -hmm. And that's what Shakespeare described. Now we bury all this under psychiatry. All human problems. If there was no mental illness, then Somehow we are battling mental illness with the idea there was no such thing, then everybody would be happy all the time and healthy all the time. 
It's assimilated to this idea of health. Obviously, if your body is healthy, your healthy body, good legs, good heart, everything, then you can run. Hmm. So there's, 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 a, there's a hidden premise, am I correct, that, that if it weren't for disease, life would be a bowl of cherries. Unproblematic. And only disease can, describe, can right. explain. And that's why we attribute war. I mean, Freud wrote about war. Well, what did Freud know about war? Nothing. What did he know about economics? Nothing. Mm -hmm. These people were utterly ignorant of economics, if you read them, of politics. Mm -hmm. So conflict, you, you, you emphasize, put a lot of emphasis on conflict as being at the heart of the human condition. At the heart of the human condition, and it is a sub subject matter of psychiatry. It's not mental illness, it's human conflict. But explained in terms of disease. But people don't get to a psychiatrist unless they have conflict. Sometimes simply conflict is in themselves. Mm -hmm. Typically some middle-aged man who has been married 20 years, has children, doesn't like his wife anymore, doesn't like his children, wants to marry a secretary. But has a conscience. Well, this is a problem. What should he do? Stay with his family? Marry his secretary, I mean, he's going to have problems either way, it doesn't matter what he chooses, what he chooses. But more typically, people are in conflict with other people. People, you know, don't get along with each other, and the wife says to the husband, unless you go and see a therapist, I'll get you divorced, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. the children misbehave, send them to a psychiatrist, give them Ritalin. It's conflict that we want to resolve, and we now turn to medicine. It's as stupid as can be. So conflict used to be an ethical matter, now it's a medical matter. Correct. Ethical matter, interpersonal matter, political matter, matter of power. It still is in politics. There is no, there is no, in politics there is no conflict. Somebody bothers you, you destroy them. You denounce them through the newspapers, you assassinate him, depending on what country you live in. It's no problem. You get rid of him. And so this is why you describe mental illness as a myth. It is a myth. How do you mean the word myth? I mean, obviously there are people it's who... A wrong, are, it's a wrong category that it categorizes a human conflict having to do with power and with moral values, choices, as though it were a problem like pneumonia. If you didn't have pneumonia, you have pneumonia and you can't breathe. You have to be in the hospital, you have to take antibiotics and they give you oxygen, that's it. But if you didn't have pneumonia, you could breathe all right. Now the idea is, if you didn't have this mental illness, you wouldn't have all these problems. So you're... No, of course it's not. It's absolute, utter, complete nonsense. So just, just to be clear, you're not I'm anticipating what other people may be thinking who haven't read your work. You're not uh, dismissing or denying the outward facts that people attach the label to. You are rejecting the label and putting... And what's associated with the label. But you see, the people I have uh, uh, never, uh, it wouldn't be true that I have never tried to convince people, because obviously if you write a book about something, you are trying to convince people of something. Mm -hmm. But I have always been very restrained in my attempts to convince people, by, because I have always fe sensed, felt, uh, that this is like a religion, this is a world view, a Weltanschauung, which adult people, once they latch on to a Weltanschauung, uh, they are not likely to change it as adults. Mm. Because the characteristic of a world and so on is that it does explain everything to them until they themselves get into trouble. But it's usually too late to change it. Then they realize it, that they have barked up the wrong tree. Mm. Now this is why there are so many... See, psychiatry is distinguished by many things from medicine, although it's supposed to be like medicine. No other doctor locks up his patients. Now, people don't pay attention to that. Well, I do. Well, if you don't pay attention to it, then you're already taking the ball. You're taking your eye off the ball. Psychiatrists go to court and tell the court, the jury, that somebody who has killed five people is not responsible for it. And they say this is not a political act. This is, this, this is a strictly scientific statement. Well, if you believe that, you can, you'll believe anything. <coughs> Can we kill this and yeah, of course. Awesome.
You could add maybe something to it without me uh, at the end of it saying, uh, we thought this was, I thought this was all we thought this was long enough and hopefully to be continued <laughs> <laughs> if Tom is still alive <laughs> or something semi humorous. Well, let's just cover a, few, a couple of more items because okay. uh, I want to talk a little bit about the drug war and then uh, uh, faith and freedom. Okay. Oh, faith and that, that, Oh, maybe you shouldn't get into that because that's, that's so complicated. Well, just the idea of why, well, this will be cut out. Okay. Way. Just why libertarians should care about this. That oh, kind of okay, that's right. But before we get to that, I, I, I wanted to bring in other uh, phrases that are associated with you. The, the therapeutic state and pharmacracy. What, what do you mean by the therapeutic state? Well, I really coined three terms, uh, two of which have already become part of the English language. I'm happy to say. The myth of manliness, by which I meant this fundamental idea that we are, uh, and I analogized it from the beginning, it is like calling, uh, like people don't get along and are worried about disease uh, or something inexplicable, and they say it's all due to a witch who has cast a spell in the village. Well, there are no witches. Obviously, there were scary old women that people were scared of. They were old, and they were women, and maybe they were toothless, and maybe they uh, uh, behaved in such a way that children were afraid of them. But they were not witches, there are simply no witches. And there is no point in talking about different theories of witches. There are no witches. Because we now talk about, you know, people say, well, you don't have a, a, a medical theory of mental illness, you have a social theory. I don't have any kind of theory, there is no mental illness. Now that was one term. The other term was a therapeutic state, which again is based on the religious analogy. For hundreds of years, people were used to living in theological states, and they still are. Saudi Arabia is still a theological state. Iran is a theological state. Priests, ayatollahs in that case, Muslim priests, are the politicians, the rulers of the country, and they rule by religious rules. Essentially, this was biblical Israel theocratic state, and even present-day Israel is a semi-theocratic state in that the Jewish laws, dietary rules, and so on, have a rule on how the society is ruled. Certainly, after all, in Muslim countries, they celebrate Friday as a holiday. In Israel, they celebrate Saturday, and we celebrate Sunday. So this is a very fundamental concept. Now, as the influence of religion declined after the Enlightenment, throughout the West. The influence, it is at the same time that modern medicine bega began, post-enlightenment, as a science. And medicine obviously has a tremendously powerful role to play in modern societies through public health, sanitation, infectious disease control, venereal disease control. I mean, in the, in the old wars, after all, people know, historians, that it, up until the First World War, most people who died in a, in a war situation died of disease, not of, not of wounds. In the civil war, more people died of disease than of being killed. So it has military, political significance. Mm -hmm. And insofar as doctors only through psychiatry, psychiatry comes in, assume more and more role in, in the enforcement of the laws, this again began through sexual control the control of homosexuals, sexual sex crimes, then various crimes. They had more and more role in daily life, public school, regulation of health, health nurses, doctors in schools, in the army. This has become more and more pervasive, whereas where now most everyday behavior is regulated but looks like a medical regulation, like after 100 years ago, anybody could go into a store and buy what he wanted. He wanted to poison his wife, he bought arsenic. He wanted to go to sleep, he bought a sleeping pill, he bought chlorhydrate. We now think we are very free. It's a joke. That's when people were free. Daily life was much less regulated. Now it's totally medically regulated, exemplified by psychiatry and the drug laws. The drug laws, of course, there were no prescription laws a hundred years ago. We are not talking about uh, utopia or 
imaginary conditions in the United States of America. You could buy, you could buy all the heroin you wanted by ordering it from Sears Roebuck in a catalog. So today people couldn't possibly imagine what, what would, would world, the world would be like without drug laws. No, if people or, tell or, me, most people who will hear this will, will not believe this or will want to check it out. They can't. They could. And in fact, you couldn't do this. You could not go back to this. You could not abolish drug laws overnight. Why? Because people wouldn't accept it or, or what reason? Are you well, people have no choice but to accept it if it's some kind of... Uh, uh, presidential order, like, you know, uh, 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 some kind of curfew or not. Mm -hmm. you simply all the stores have opened up. Mm -hmm. No, because their first inclination now is, this now ties into something else, and that is people wouldn't dare to sell it. Supposing oh. you run a Walgreens chain, mm -hmm. and tomorrow morning you can sell all the heroin you want. Well, you, if you had any sense, you wouldn't sell it because you know very well that somebody would go home, take too much, kill himself, and then his relatives would sue you. And given the present legal climate, the last person who is found guilty of anything is the person who is doing it. <laughs> the, the whole legal system, American le half of American lawyers would become unemployed. F four fifths of them now live on blaming people for things for which someone else is responsible. So which came first, this, this loss of self-responsibility or, uh, or, or the therapeutic state, or they come together? This, this, is one, this is one single, it's like in a totalitarian state, what comes first? The war, the persecution of, Jew, of minorities, the loss of civil liberties for everyone, the increasing regulation of the economy, this goes all hand in hand. More statism, this is entirely libertarian phenomenon. And this touches on, on one of the puzzlements for which I wrote, about which I wrote a book of why libertarians are turning and seem to be so uncomfortable with this subject. They will not discuss civil commitment, the insanity defense, and suicide. These three subjects are singularly absent. In, they don't address these, which are to me the three the three horsemen out of the four, of what ought to be libertarian concerns. Because this has the epitomes of self-ownership, mm -hmm. which is the base concept of libertarianism, as I see. I own myself, I'm responsible for myself. The, ch the church doesn't own me, the state doesn't own me, my parents don't own me after I'm 18 or 21, like in ancient Rome. Mm -hmm. Now this has only three agencies that could possibly own you. Who else could own you? So you have a right yeah. to be dangerous to yourself? You have a right to be dangerous to yourself. You have a right to kill yourself. You have a right to be mentally ill. You have a right to say you are Napoleon. You have a right to have delusions, hallucinations. You don't have a right to deprive another person of life, liberty, or property. And if you do that, you have to be controlled and punished regardless of why you do it. Right. Legally, not medically. Legally. Criminally. Inquiry into the motives is, is, is important, is interesting, is relevant, but is secondary to your guilt. If, in fact, de facto, you have done this, then you are the one who should be punished, not the subject, not someone else. In other words, if you kill yourself, you have done this, not your psychiatrist, not your doctor, not your pharmacist, not your wife who has tortured you, and so on. All of which may have been reasons. But today suicide is blamed on depression or some other kind of but somebody else. mental illness. And somebody else. But this again is deeply ingrained because you, again, remember, people ought to remember that only a hundred years ago, if you were a, a good Catholic in a serious Catholic community or Jew, and if you killed yourself, the priest or the rabbi would not bury you, it would not give you a religious ceremony. It's a religion, organized Western religions that first adopted this idea that anybody who kills himself is ipso facto, posthumously, they didn't know anything about it. It was mental ill at the time. Because they don't want to punish. They don't, the whole issue of responsibility has been, psychiatry is the enemy of human agency and responsibility and liberty, unfortunately. 
So the, okay, that seems like a, a key point. It it's is a key an point. enemy of human agency of, of, of human uh, agent. And they're for freedom. They're for freedom. They define it out of existence. Well, that's what Freud talked about, psychic determinism. Everything is determined by how you were treated when you were three years old. That's a caricature of it. Mm -hmm. Of course, Freud didn't quite mean this, because mm -hmm. he was himself a, an old-fashioned person. But this is what he was saying. This is scientism. Hayek talked about this beautifully, without ever really getting into psychiatry. Mm -hmm. The abuse because of science, or the science, mimicking science, mimicking where it's science. not appropriate. Yeah. This is all in Hayek, without the psychiatry. Mm -hmm. And this is where you tie uh, your views or psychiatry in with neoclassical economics. In, in Frank, this is Hayek and Mises. What I am saying is really is just taking seriously what Hayek and Mises in the Rothbard said. So why don't you think libertarians are more are concerned about that? I was going to say more concerned, but they don't seem many not concerned at all. Why, why not? Oh, I'd rather not go into that. I mean, certainly one reason would be that some aspects of so-called libertarianism, I mean, and Rand and objectivism, I mean, they acted like they were doing a kind of psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, their particular philosophy is a correct way of living, mm -hmm. which is what psychotherapy is about. Psychotherapy is inherently a moral enterprise, but that's submerged in the, in the medical terminology and ideas. I mean, the basic question is, how should we live? I mean, you have a son who is misbehaves. Well, how do you want him to behave and why? Back to conflict again. Back, Back to, to conflict. conflict. I mean, he's hyperactive. He doesn't pay attention. He doesn't obey you. But you want to give him a drug? But people believe that's a real disease of some kind, or some kind of people illness. Believe, people always <laughs> believe what's convenient for them, especially when there is a power differential. Hmm. See, the whole problem in in the family is the, the, the existence of power and the denial of power. Parents have total control over children. I was terribly aware of that, although I had fantastically good parents. Maybe that's the reason that I could be aware of it. Uh, so that, when, so that when, when a parent says, I think that a, a drug would help him, well, it's very convenient. That who, who is there to disagree? And the doctors say, yes, absolutely, that's what he needs. And the New York Times says, that's what he needs. I mean, it needs a kind of mental independence and, and, and sophistication that very few people have. Hmm. They have all the authorities, the American Medical Association, the American Bar Association, the New York Times, the American government, all say this is correct. National Institute of Mental Health. Well, why should they listen to me? Well, that, that relates to my next question. Uh, you taught psychiatry for a very long time in the School of Medicine, you, and you practiced. You had patient clients, I don't know what you called them. But how, how did your colleagues and your students uh, Sheldon, I tell react? You so, I tell you something. We'll have another interview when I'm 95. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because that's really... That's a, that's a long story. A very long story. Okay, then let's end on this note then. Who were, I asked you this earlier, off camera, who were your, who influenced you, who are your, your heroes, your intellectual heroes? Uh, people you read and thought you learned most from? The early days. When in my life, you see that, because there are many, there are many. Uh, early in life, my intellectual heroes were Mark Twain, who was, we talked about, was very popular writer, was a popular writer in Hungary, I read him as a child. Mm -hmm. Huckleberry Finn, you know, I was, uh, it was like, you know, taking a raft down the Danube, except there were no, <laughs> except there were no blacks or Negroes in, in, in Hungary. Uh, and, of course, Tom Sawyer, I mean, that was all very uh, fantastic stories at every level. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, many of the French Enlightenment writers, like Voltaire, uh, Montesquieu, and then later John Locke, uh, John Stuart Mill, Bertrand Russell, uh, Swift, the American, you know, Madison, Jefferson, uh, Hayek, Mises. You have to mention Mencken here. Mencken, oh, Mencken, sorry. I mean, Mencken is <laughs> right on the top. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Yeah. Okay, well, I thank you very much. This is uh, thank fascinating. You. Thank you.